Christina, let me first ask you about the boom that we saw last year and really the first month of this year as well. Um, are you are you readying the building blocks for that to continue? Absolutely, and Matt and Ed, thanks for having me. Um, great to be here. Ed, great to see you in person. Hopefully we'll be in person out in Terranea in May. Yeah, we had a great year last year, as you, as you commented. The M&A market last year was a $4.7 trillion market. Goldman um, is number one in that market. On the uh, leveraged finance markets last year, we did $1.1 trillion last year. Um, we're at the top of the league tables in those markets as well. And importantly, last year, we saw sponsors continue to gain market share in those markets. And so in the M&A market of that $4.7 trillion, sponsors accounted for 36%. In the leveraged finance markets, it was higher, 43%. Now, that compares to the peak of 55% a few years ago, but we are seeing a tremendous amount of activity from sponsors. Christina, when I think about what's going on now, and particularly, I suppose, since the start of the year, we've seen this phenomenon where the, the equity indices have obviously come in a lot. At the same time, we've seen a ton of liquidity flowing into, into the market uh, in terms of, of loans. And I wonder, where does that money find a home? Because I look at corporate balance sheets, they look strong. Companies have come out of the pandemic fairly healthy. Uh, sponsors, as we know, already have a ton of cash, but are struggling with some of the valuations. So where does all that loan liquidity actually find a home? Well, if you take a look at the first month of January, even with some volatility, the floating rate product is, to your point, the loan fund product was extremely robust. We had the single largest LBO volume month in the history of the loan market. $30 billion came through the loan market and found a home and also $9 billion of LBO loans price. So $39 billion came through in the first month of the year. And what's really interesting is four transactions accounted for $25 billion. So the size and scale of the transactions that are occurring in acquisition finance, and particularly in LBOs, is going up meaningfully. And just a few days ago, as you know, we announced a transaction where the financing alone is $15 billion. So there will be, I believe, a lot of supply to fill the demand for the asset class. There was, of course, Citrix, just in case viewers are wondering. Uh, the Citrix transaction was one of the largest of all time, I think, top five in the LBO space. But I, but I wonder, it, 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 from where you sit, obviously, you've seen this market sort of go through various phases. We've seen LBO paper go. I'm old, Ed. You see how we <laughs> go through, uh, let's, let's say, several uh, cycles uh, and mini cycles within those. Um, at the moment, from where we sit, it looks relatively expensive compared to where it was very recently. But obviously, historically, it's still cheap. And I wonder how companies are thinking about that and how acquirers are thinking about that. Are they expecting it to come back in and holding fire? Or do they go now on the basis that it may go back up? You raise a really good point. If you take a look at what's happened in the last month and just compare it to the tights of 21, across the triple C high yield index or the single B high yield index, we're only 150 wide. Now that seems like a lot, but in historic terms, pricing LBO debt at six and a half percent for unsecured notes is very attractive on a historic basis. In addition, the loan market is basically flat to the end of the year. Again, the technical there is extremely strong. So what I predict is corporate borrowers will realize we have a rising rate environment finally and avail themselves of pretty attractive rates right now. Yes. And the sponsor, the sponsors are going to have to sort of level set, readjust their cost of capital a bit, 100 to 150 basis points if you're talking about the, the, the bond part of the capital structure and the loan side of floating rate product as rates rise, that will rise as well. But I actually think it's just a orderly recalibration of the cost of buying companies. Yeah, I was going to ask about um, whether the rising rates act as a prod. I think Jan Hatzius right now has his forecast for five rate hikes this right. year, but with um, the risk to the upside, does this get uh, clients to go out into the market sooner rather than later? Again, I think if you are in acquisition finance, as you know, you, you're, you're bound to the purchase and sale agreement and the timing and closing of that transaction, so you, you basically have a narrow window. I think you're talking about opportunistic financing, uh, and I believe, yes, now that the markets seem to have settled from the volatility last week, you are going to start to see more issuance, but we already had an incredible month for the start to the year. So that is why, you know, Ed and I, you have spoken about this, 
we're very bullish on credit and the, the, the volume of transactions that we see happening in, in 22. Christina, when I look at what's going on, obviously we, we talked about what's happening in the equity markets, but also just geopolitically, there is, I think it's fair to say, a lot right now that could go wrong. I, I hear this bullish tone being struck, whether it's from M&A bankers, whether it's from people on the credit side. And I wonder from where you sit, what do you see as the number one risk that could turn this the other way and could put us into a struggling market? I think through the credit lens, I would say something more akin to a stagflation environment. I think the equity markets are watching growth very carefully. We're watching inflation, what could happen to margins. And yes, of course, geopolitical shocks would not be great. But I, that's what I think would derail the credit markets more, would be a real surprise um, to the economy. And if the Fed you know, didn't maintain an orderly rate rising environment. How much of a concern is volatility? We saw it obviously last week, as you mentioned. If it comes back, is that a problem? You know, it's manageable. I think, again, if you can be patient and also when you see a window finance, I think it's quite manageable. But we're going to be in a more volatile environment. Um, and that's just the reality of, of basically a, a recalibration of risk. But I'm not too concerned about it.